and today we are joined by Victoria Mateski and Taf Mohammed, and we're going to be speaking about marriage which is a topic which is always interesting it's always interesting and we've got two very qualified people to speak about the topic um so go ahead guys tell us a little bit about yourselves Okay, well, assalamu alaikum, everybody. Good evening, wherever you're watching from. Okay, so where do we start? So, uh, well, my, like you said, my name is Victoria Mateski. By the way, you pronounced it correct. Mashallah. People very rarely get my name correct. <laughs> uh, What's so, the worst you've ever had, Victoria? Mate Sky. It's usually <laughs> Mate Sky. Okay. Yeah, Mate Sky. Mate Sky. Yes. Sounds like some kind of a rocket, doesn't it? Right? <laughs> it does. It's <laughs> Polish. My my grandparents are from Poland. Uh, I'm I'm born and raised in America, if you can tell by my accent. Uh, and and I'm Taf. <laughs> I don't have any Welsh connections. It's just uh, Tafazal being shortened to Taf, and I've known that since I was I was a child. And uh, she's my better half. Yeah, we've been uh, married now for this is our we're in our fifth year of marriage. Alhamdulillah. And we have, uh, we're the co-founders of Tea for Two, which is an amazing um, endeavor that we started on the brink of uh, finding love ourselves. And we work with exclusively with Muslims and help Muslims find, create, cultivate, and celebrate love in all different ways. So that's kind of our mission. We're, we're relationship coaches. I like to call myself the Muslim love coach. It's, uh, yeah, sort of my obsession, alhamdulillah. <laughs> amazing and i think what sets you guys apart is that you guys actually you you work together and you deliver you d you deliver your services together right as a couple we we do we do yes we, we work with couples uh, as a couples and that dynamic that male female energy or mix as you like you know really helps particularly for men muslim men to uh, really open up seeing another man who uh, I mean, I, I become very open and vulnerable with 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 men, particularly, so they can open up and sh and share their anxieties and, and and so on and so forth. And and what's the response been? Do you find do you find having um, having another male figure that makes makes the men feel at ease and com more comfortable with sharing? Do you think? You know, seriously, um, for me, um, the only time I opened up was in my fifties, right? And that's because um number one of all because of the identities that i that i have multiple identities so being a man being an asian man and then being a muslim man it seemed like all those things um were stacked against me in one sense to really open up emotionally uh, where we live we live in leeds and leeds has the highest rate of suicide for men in their late 40s and a lot, a lot of it's put down you look at research is they're unable to express themselves or articulate themselves effectively so when they're facing a, a plethora of issues and challenges, they more often than not suppress those feelings and those emotions and are unable to really uh, have anyone to share those emotions with. And therefore, um, we, we always say that nothing's ever suppressed, but expressed in different ways. So they manifest themselves in, in different ways, whether that's addiction, uh, poor health, um, you know, anxiety, uh, really even you know you have people who are depressed and then obviously ultimately some some end up taking their life so uh, that's in the wider context but but also you, know, you have the nuances being a man of of faith and a man of color and then you know that kind of <clears throat> brings in a, a different dynamic like i say so yeah with me actually opening up and that's the main thing when i become <laughs> vulnerable and share my own life story and my own childhood trauma uh, that really helps um, men to connect to my story because they can see themselves in that story. And, and that connective energy, as you like, you know, um, it, it really helps them to not only connect, but also uh, believe that there are other people out there who are struggling or had some struggles. And that really helps them to open up. I mean, I, I'm a, I've had men on... On, on a train to London and I'm speaking to them and it's like a colleague working in, a, in, in, in one of my former workplaces and uh, I opened up to him and I, and I said to him when I was in Pakistan, you know, I was sexually abused and it was the first time I ever said that when I was 52 and it was after 40 years of holding that a secret and now when I opened up then he came back within 30 minutes and said, so have I. Wow. So 
that gives you the power of, you know, of, of, of being vulnerable, but also allowing people or giving people permission that if they so wish that they can also themselves open up. And it's not that, you know, if we have a perfect picture that there's no backstory, mm -hmm. you know, everyone has um, had experienced different things in different ways. So yeah, that, that I think that dynamic of having a man who, um, I mean, I can articulate myself in terms of what I've been through and my struggles over many, many years. And uh, that really helps uh, them to connect with not only my story, like I say, but also that they can put themselves in that story. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different layers, you know, you're saying like being, being a man is, is, is uh, you know, when then you've got the cultural and then the religious, like it just compounds, doesn't it? It just makes it all the more difficult. It, it, it compounds and, and, it, and it's not very uh, cool or, or, or manly or you're not, you're not an alpha. If you, if, mm. oh, you know, you're not, you're not an alpha. If you can, if you accept that, you know, I've struggled or I am struggling, because mm -hmm. right? he's not meant to actually, is he? He's meant to kind of be always, you know, at the forefront and brave and kind of holding the fort, so to speak. But we all mm -hmm. crack. We all crack. We all crack in different ways. Yeah, one of the one of the things that Taff and I, after we found each other and fell in love and. We're sitting on our honeymoon in Spain is we really sat down, we're sitting on this park bench and we looked at each other and we said, how can other Muslims have what we have? Mm -hmm. And we knew from the very beginning before we ever decided to become relationship coaches or get into uh, become experts on marriage, uh, we knew that it was missing in this field. We didn't see enough positive Muslim marriages. We didn't, we weren't seeing it as much as we wanted to. And so for us, it was like, how do we bring this to people in a way that beautifies marriage in, in a way that and we're not seeing it as much. So that was sort of our mission from the beginning. We talked about it. We're like, let's write a book. And we're still writing that book, but Alhamdulillah, it led us many years later down this road. Of, of working directly with Muslims mm -hmm. and it's been it's been so incredible yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. And, and we made a conscious choice because because you know with some of the um accolades that we have and, and the courses that we've done and certifications we can really work in a really wide context mm -hmm. uh, but we specifically made the intention no what we're going to do is we're going to work only with Muslims and, and that's because we believe whilst there are so many coaches and therapists out there there are simply not enough and we're under no illusion that you know we're the only ones. No, no way. there's, there's we, many. We, people, yeah. uh, it's a drop in the ocean right now. We we could have thousands more, and we still won't have enough. Mm. And I would say that is because when we uh, attend courses and do these things and functions, we see so many other faith and non-faith communities actually very active in this area. And okay. they're not only active, they're really ahead of the game in terms of scientific data research. Uh, and all that information really helps. So we, we have this thing that, you know, what we really have is we have the Dean and the data, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that is so important because we're saying that we're very uh, faith inspired, but we're not dogmatic. We won't preach to people about faith. We're faith inspired. We're inspired by faith. And we know mm -hmm. the people that we work with, we want them to be, um, people who are also of that same faith so when we speak about certain things where we hope to inspire them but also we uh, attach that to data very rigorous data in terms of what a scientist in relationship is saying how it works and we have um, a system which we use which really a, a couple can put in their respective information mm -hmm. uh, separately and what comes out is charts and graphs and so much data to tell them give them a snapshot as as to where the relationship their relationship is right now and we'll go into uh, modes of communication how they resolve conflict their personality type their origin family map it, it goes in such a comprehensive way to detail and it puts the facts behind the feelings so you know when you're feeling like mm -hmm. oh, she's not hearing me well this report will say this is why she isn't hearing you is because of this reason <laughs> Oh, wow. That sounds incredible. It's very um, empowering. Very empowering. And just with regard to, to, to the specifically Muslim community, 
how how much is the Muslim community affected by wider mainstream um, uh, trends in marriage and divorce? Well, it's a really big, uh, really important question, actually. And um, one of the issues that we see, especially, um, with, I should say issue, I'll say challenge, okay, because that seems better to me. One of the challenges that we see, especially with people who are new to the faith, and I say new as in like within 10 years, because look, we're all really new for a while, uh, is we're raised in not a non-Muslim world, okay? So we're not raised with these ideas and concepts and we're coming into this faith. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk about it from a woman's perspective because this is really important. And I say this like from my personal experience is that when you're raised in a non-Muslim country, we're raised as women to have to raise be raised to be liked by everybody we have to we have to appease the crowd we have to smile we have to look good we have to make sure that everyone in the room knows that we're we're acceptable and our worth is dependent on other people's opinions of us and then we come into this beautiful faith and it's completely different it's completely different. Our worth is not dependent on anybody else except God. And then the the things that we treasure the most, our beauty, our character, we get to decide who gets to see those. We were told, you know, we, we are allowed to only show this to people that we really truly are able to. And so that affects the marriage process for a lot of converts. They get, um, they come in with, they have to kind of adjust and pivot that idea and mindset when looking for a partner so um you know that's just really specific for converts but and we're very cognizant of that fact and always sensitive yeah. for that as well so we're not under no illusion that you know it's like all you know everything in kind of thing you mm -hmm. know it's very custom or bespoke you know the way we approach um individuals the the wider context if i understood your question a wider sense you know so Data suggests that in the UK, forty-five percent of those who get married get end up getting divorced. And then, and then in the USA, it's even it's even higher. The USA is nearly fifty percent. And is in, is this mainstream? Sorry, or or in, in, specific? In, okay. Mainstream. And then in Australia, it's forty-two percent. Uh, the Family and Youth Institute, um, which is a Muslim-led organization in America, in America, yeah, there is some data, and they suggest that thirty-three percent of American Muslims who get uh, married end up getting divorced. So this um, is, we, we don't have a lot of data and yeah. we've actually uh, started to collect some data ourselves on divorced Muslims here around the world and uh, different mm -hmm. countries. We need more people doing it. So yeah, there is definitely, mm -hmm. it's upon us. Yeah, uh, and, and it's the prevalent issues that most couples are facing. Okay. Right, so it's very, uh, it, it's just whatever other people are facing with some differences. And, you know, it's down to uh, communication or lack thereof, uh, not able to resolve conflict because they don't have the skills, right? So it's lack of skills. And even the FYI, you know, the um, uh, Youth Institute, what they said was the main culprit uh, being the lack of pre-marital education. Yeah, the, the statistic is that if you, uh, couples it get just even a little bit of premarital education, it can reduce your chances of divorce by up to 33%. Now we're talking like just taking a class, reading a book. Well, wow. we're not talking about, you know, going yes, to university yes. and yeah. getting a degree for four years. We're talking about the little, the smallest amount of premarital education mm -hmm. can reduce that. Uh, so that's huge. It's huge. It's, huge. And we, we always say that, look, if, if people have to go through a six month driving course to end up, you know, have a license or go to university for three years to get a degree, you know, you want to get married for life, but <laughs> hey, ho, no planning. Mm -hmm. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Let's go straight in. But it, it doesn't make sense in that, in that respect. If you think of it that way, you know, if it's a lifelong thing, commitment, right. Something for uh, the length of your life, whatever that is, I'm mean, sure there should be some preparation. And mm -hmm. we're not talking about just, you know, knowing a few details, but really, you know, what is marriage about? How will this change the dynamic? I'm living by myself when I live with someone else, you know, that dynamic of communication again, or, you know, when there's a conflict that arises, it's going to arise. How do we resolve conflicts? What are the skills around conflicts? What about temperaments? What about characters? What, how, how can you, compromise and we always say it's not about compromising but it's about come to a promise so what promises are you going to make to each other mm -hmm. right 
and not, you know, because compromise means I'm going to forego something and I'm, uh, there's an expectation that you're going to fulfill something. But anything that's unspoken is a dream, right? If I, do, if I don't articulate that, it's some, I have a dream in my mind about that thing being fulfilled, but it's about how do I articulate that? You know what? If I do, you know, accept something, let's promise to each other something. Mm hmm. Uh, and how how much of of your uh, or or what's your observation with regard to I mean is most of your time taken up by um, existing couples with marriage problems or is it are you seeing more and more people realizing that actually I need to put some time and some work in beforehand in order to make it a success is it currently as things stand is it is it more the former or is it well, it's a great question. I'll tell you what, when we started doing this work and getting public and sharing our story, initially we had a lot of single Muslims uh, following us and engaging with us and going, okay, how do you do this thing? How do we do this thing called marriage in our faith and do it right? They were really concerned and we were, mashallah, we were so impressed that there were so many people coming out uh, to learn from others how to do it. And um, so I definitely feel that the ebb and flow is changing. We're becoming okay. wiser. We're becoming more educated. Like never before, we have touch points where you can get information, you know, at the drop of a hat. You can, you know, Google, you can get on Clubhouse, you can get on Instagram, YouTube. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge is there and it's so touchable now that it's not, um, it's not unrealistic to get out there and do it. So that being said, that was sort of the beginning. And now as a, uh, I feel that we, because we share a lot of our story and we share a lot of our wins as a couple and some of our struggles, mm -hmm. we have seen a lot more couples come out yes, of definitely. the woodwork. Mm -hmm. And we know that there has a, a lot of couples struggling, but like Taf had mentioned earlier, it's really hard for them to admit that they need help. Mm. So mm. um We've been seeing a lot of couples. We actually just did an incredible uh, five-day Muslim marriage challenge with our community. And we had so many Muslim couples from over the world that. participating mm -hmm. in it. Um, it was great, but it was amazing how we still see a lot of the women taking the lead. Uh, I mean, we know that like you had mentioned about the men still having that struggle. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's interesting, but at the more we are showing up, the more we feel that it's giving others to show up. Mm. That's what mm. our, that's what we hope. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing that now quite a bit. And, and your stories um, uh, individually and and kind of together is is so is so interesting. You know, uh, with you being a convert and then with it being a cultural, you know, difference. And even even like coming from the US and not from uh, the UK or Europe. Can you can you shed some light on kind of what some of the uh, Oh, it's a complex one, bro. It's a complex. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the likelihood is if you are a convert in the West, America, Canada, United Kingdom, the likelihood of you marrying someone from a different culture isn't a possibility. It's a likelihood. So I knew when I took my Shahada, I was a single woman. The likelihood of me marrying uh, someone from a different culture was is most likely going to happen. Um I didn't plan to meet Taf. It was very organic and very natural. I, I and I had no idea. We were four thousand miles apart, and um, I had Let's been. A, <laughs> I'd been a Muslim. I I believe I was probably in my second year of practicing as a Muslim, and um, I was on this. Uh, you know, I was sort of in the pits. Let me just be really honest. I wasn't really happy with men in my life, and so as a single woman, I'm like this strong, independent woman, and. I was really looking for evidence that there were some good men left out there. <laughs> and along comes him in my feed on social media. And there was one fact that really kind of caught her eye, uh, but I keep in suspense. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he, he, I, I'll, I'll make the a long story short, but we basically, I, I, I friend requested him and started following him on Facebook and sort of, then I just, I, we became friends and the, the, uh, you carry on sorry you carry on yeah <laughs> we became friends on instagram so anyways i'm following him and uh he was posting such motivational inspirational things all the time we did we both did a lot of humanitarian work at the time i was a uh a successful photographer i ran my own studio in america uh for over 10 years so he here's this brother on a hike and he had this 
and, and, and here's the thing here's the thing professional canon camera around his neck he's taking a picture and i'm a, I'm a photographer thinking okay mashallah here's a brother who's doing humanitarian work he's very he's posting great stuff he has got a nice camera on his neck and the this camera by the way is only bought about four weeks before the <laughs> seriously so I, I just kind of thought I, I need a hobby or something you know? I, so I, I bought a camera I thought yeah I could do with some photography I sent him a friend request just because I wanted good people in my circle I wasn't um, looking for marriage at the time but I actually thought he was such an incredible brother I said to myself I need to go find his wife she's got to be amazing and so I went searching through all his friends where's his wife where's his wife and I'm thinking oh he's hiding her typical guy he's yeah. hiding his wife she's nowhere to be found it was it was pretty funny. Uh, so needless to say, I dropped him a message one day just to say I slid in his DMs. He did not get into mine. Uh, and I told him, you know, I just want to say thank you for being so inspirational and posting such great content. It, it's really inspiring. And me. then when she did that, I, I went like this. Uh, oh, my God. I'm, I think I've been catfished. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat on that for three days. With, he did. With sisters. Three no days, I, no I response. Thought, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, he, he didn't. He didn't respond to me for a few days. So needless to say, I mean, Taff and I are really big believers that you can find your your soul partner anywhere. Mm. You can find them on Instagram. You can find them in a grocery store. You can find them at the mosque. You can find them anywhere. It, 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 the thing is, is about our story that was really beautiful is Taff and I are both grandparents. Both of us have adult children both of us had been divorced. And so we had such similar, and we also had spent almost a year doing healing mm -hmm. before we met. And without us realizing it at the time, we had, were working towards becoming the ideal partners for each other. We were, mm -hmm. we had done so much work that I, I would have never recognized what a great man he was or brother he was. I had not, not elevated myself to the level I was at. Um, and he would have never recognized me. So that work that's the key for us that, that really that led really, us to each other and we always cover this when we speak about this publicly or even when we're doing sessions is that you know the, the extent to which you do um your, your personal work will actually be the ceiling uh for the person that you eventually meet right so the more you put the work in mm -hmm. uh, your expectations and 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 what you what you can expect will be a lot higher it's just the way things work you know people i mean she would not have seen me had it been three years before that for example mm -hmm. because my energy was down here so we always give this like you know like if you look at this you know if i'm down here she's up here she can't see me because she's looking at this level and i'm down here right mm -hmm. but as soon as mm -hmm. i raise my level she can we're on the same level now we can see each other in that sense so it's about how we raise our personal energy you know in in all aspects you know uh, physical emotional psychological spiritual mm -hmm. and, and when, we, when we look at those areas we, we, you know the pies you know physical intellectual emotional spiritual when you, you look at those areas and you um keep um, strengthening those energy baskets what happens is your your state overall state is raised your well-being is is better and and the, the better and stronger you are you know your your own personal expectations become higher even Okay, I, I I picked up on something uh, that I wanted to ask you about. So it seems like there was some um, transformation that took place individually um, that took you from your energy, as when you described it as being here to there. Was that a conscious? Okay, so was one was it a conscious thing? Did you decide I want to do this? And if so, like how did how or how did that come about? You go first. I I, I can I'll express. It was definitely a completely mm -hmm. conscious choice. Um, Taff and I were not looking for marriage when we found each other. Matter of fact, I think we were both a little, I don't want to say allergic to the idea of marriage, but we were not in a place where we were looking for a spouse. Hence why when I found him, I was looking for the wife, not to determine if he was single or not. I, matter of fact, I didn't even think about marriage probably till a few of our conversations in. And I realized we were both single. And I had this moment, like, did God just send this man to me? Or did I, <laughs> you know, so like, maybe I need to explore this. Um, so definitely was intentional. Um, it was, it, we really, because of our journey and, and going through such heart, heartache and so many challenges, we 
sorry, I just had a call come in. We had so many challenges that we had to take that time to really, uh, truly heal. And I never in a million years thought that I would be in the position I am now, um, married to an incredible man, but not only that, but then doing the work where I'm sharing this, how to do with others. So this is something that's really interesting, no matter where you are in your love journey, especially if you're single, it can feel really daunting. And I, I, I will, I really want to say this, this is true for my heart. You do not know what God has in store for you. You do not know what's around the corner for you. Mm-hmm. I had never traveled in my life. I had never, I'd never, I didn't have a tra- passport. Uh, Taff and I lived, you know, on other sides of the world. We had one mutual friend. Uh, I couldn't even have imagined the life I have now several years ago. It was, it would have been like a fairy tale. And this is what, if I had not done that work to raise my level up to feeling confident about myself and happy about my life and satisfied with what I was doing as a person individually, I don't think I would ever have gotten here. So yeah, yeah but add to that. And, and I know for and you is definitely me, intentional. Around, I mean, you know, uh, when, when I um, had to leave my home, let's say, um, I went to live with my eldest son and I slept on his living room sofa for four months. So I had this sports holder with just the clothes I could get. And I was so living at that small back. But four months into this, I'd say it was, it was a depressive state. So I was depressed. Mm-hmm. And I remember very vividly one morning, the sun rays were coming through the curtain. <laughs> and, and this thought crossed my mind that no man should ever experience what I'm experiencing right now. You know, I've been there, done it, um, you know, marriage, children, home, everything. But here I was sleeping on his sofa. I didn't have any belongings apart from those few shirts and, 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 and trousers I had. And that was a changing point. I said to myself, I cannot continue like this and I must stop feeling sorry for myself. Literally. And, and the epiphany for me was, when I finally decided, I realized that, you know, most people who go through hardships, uh, especially when they've been married, perhaps have given up something that they used to do when they were single. That was certainly for me the case, you know, so I was a gym junkie, right? Yeah. Always in the gym, doing things, looking after myself. And over the years, I've given up and I realized, oh, wow, my thing is, my, is the gym. And so I, I looked on my phone and I found a, a, a deal, pure gym nine pound 99 and then what i said to myself i said i can't afford that but you could and i realized actually i got into a really bad state where i couldn't afford 10 pound for myself yet i would spend hundreds and thousands for everyone else so the lesson i learned there was that i wasn't doing self-care in fact i was totally neglecting myself totally and that point was a, the, the, the junction, the, the turning point for me that this will never happen again. So absolutely. Uh, Tony Robbins says, you know, it sometimes takes people to decide to do something. But once they decide, change can happen overnight. And that literally is what happened to me. I decided it's not going to be anymore. I bought that really expensive subscription of £10, <laughs> right? I got in there and I struggled on on, on the, on the uh, um, what they call it, the... Uh, walking machine Political. whatever it is. yeah or the yeah the treadmill yeah. treadmill that's it and mm. and that was that that was a shift so absolutely that had to happen in my it had to happen when i was looking after myself mm, okay and it, so this idea of self care because it's become very vogue um in in just just generally uh, and i think it means something um mm. different or something slightly different to muslims because self care can be very egotistical it, it yes. can it can put the ego at the center center of things and that's gem- that's not the muslim world view well we well, we always we always have a distinction of being someone who is focused on your self care as instead of being self centered being soul centered mm. and we cannot pour from an empty cup and the best of believers uh, of mankind are those that are best to other believers and how can you show up 
How can you give? How can you serve your family, your closest loved ones? How can you do what you're destined to do if you yourself are empty mm -hmm. and you are not feeling mm -hmm. a complete person? Mm -hmm. So you have to, we, we always try to work with believers, people who uh, follow Islam to look at this as in a completely different way. You have to do this. We, we, are, we are going to be um, accountable for what we're capable of, not mm -hmm. and, and what we do with that, mm -hmm. uh, the gifts that we're given. And the hadith says, uh, paraphrase it, you know, the, the closest people to Allah are the most useful to his dependence. No, people are the dependents of Allah and the closest people to Allah are the most useful to his dependence. Yes. Mm -hmm. How could he be useful to other people if you haven't got that? energy yourself if you don't have the the physical ability if you haven't got the mental ability the emotional ability or spiritual ability so really it's about that you know that cup filling your cup first and we mm -hmm. also know that allah says in in the quran that you know um allah will not ch change the condition of a people until they change what's within themselves mm. so this is very soul centered it's, it's nothing outside of that you know we it's in our bodies and everything else that we have that we've been given uh, are a, an amana, a trust. Mm -hmm. The Almighty has given them to us as a trust. So we have to look after that trust, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever it takes and whatever we do to look after that trust actually is being soul centered. Mm -hmm. So it completely shifts the paradigm in the way we think about this thing. In, really interesting. I think there's there's so much to say about this. I I I did I did want to introduce or go or rather go back to something um that uh, something that we touched upon earlier. You said that there was um the the data on um kind of Muslim marriage uh is, is scant. I, I can imagine it's even more kind of mm -hmm. scarce for for converts too. Um, so but from your experience dealing um and speaking to converts, what what challenges are are coming out and what what's working and what's not and what your, your observations well there's a, a few things that come up quite often with working with converts and from my own experience as well um and the first one is is that a lot of people that are new to islam feel this need to change who they are and i'm not talking about changing all of your what we call haram activity. I'm talking about changing who you are. Like you need to become a different person. Intrinsically, yes. Yeah, intrinsically. Mm -hmm. And Brene Brown, she's an author. She has this beautiful quote and I love this. And she says, don't walk into the world looking for evidence that you don't belong because you'll always find it. You know, your worth and belonging aren't to be negotiated with other people. And you cannot change who you are to suit somebody else. So this is the first uh, thing we see is that, uh, especially with a lot of intercultural relationships, uh, that, you know, there is a lot of that going on where we feel like I must mold into be something for someone else. Mm -hmm. And it never works. I'm telling you right now, the data proves it. It never works. You can repress it as long as you want you have to show up and be your authentic self and learn to embrace your gifts. And so that's the first issue. Um, the second one we really see a lot of is that there's a lot of confusion on how to do marriage and get to know someone in a way that's halal, a mm -hmm. way that is in line with our faith, because we're coming from a world where we're expected to try it before you buy it you know, date somebody for several years, maybe even live with them for a few years before you, mm -hmm. I remember a lot of my non-Muslim friends, um, cause Taff and I courted for four months, long distance, mm -hmm. four months. Mm -hmm. And then we, when we met, we literally got married within 48 hours. And so people are like, well, what if he's a bad kisser? And I said, <laughs> my non-Muslim friends, they're thinking, well, well you, you can't marry a man you've never kissed. And I said, I'll teach him how to kiss. It's okay. We'll, we'll work that out. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but I think it's a struggle for uh, converts to figure out, like, how do I find somebody? How do I, I get to know them and know that I'm making a good choice? Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. we don't, our faith doesn't, we don't have a try it before you buy it policy. That's not how we work. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably one of the biggest struggles. Yeah, it's, it's tricky and, and it, the, the, there is a process. I mean, I wrote an article on, you know, halal courtship and, and, and three essentials that people need to really consider very carefully uh, and how that's done. And perhaps I could share that with you. You could share with the general audience. Mm -hmm. But the, the real um, 
I think the foundation is this that you know, particularly on this issue, is that um, you know, in life generally, uh, for, for for all the brothers and sisters, in life generally, you know, it's not that we won't get to the answer what we're looking for. You know, there's Google, shape Google, and all sorts of other. <laughs> shoe out there of different types and sizes right which give you advice and that's good and well but it might take you five years to get there and sometimes you may, may struggle and make mistakes the most important thing certainly from our perspective is that look what you need is you need mentors right you need a mentor or a, a couple that are mentors and the reason for that is that a mentor right will show you the path will illuminate that path for you so you can see it's not that you won't see eventually it just shortens the, the time to get mm. there and they'll have insights that you may never even realize that the distinctions are there so you know we we, we we talk about life generally that we don't want people to live life by default we want people to live life by design living life by default is like just every day is the same and you're not really thinking about what you're doing it's very incidental not intentional yeah yeah mm. when it's designed it's very intentional and the same thing is with with, with marriage and the pursuit of of, of a life partner it, it cannot be left a chance having a mentor will be able to guide you support you mentor you advise you uh, based on their experience so the first thing we really you know encourage people to have is uh, people who the people who surround them right who are really stable people stable mm. in the sense that um, they give good advice they give valid advice they give current examples they have life they experience life themselves Mm -hmm. and, and and they're able to give you that i think the most important thing is is to give you the the confidence sometimes people might think that they can do it themselves mm -hmm. but there's, there's a margin of error and a chance that people might take especially for example for for converts who may um maybe by themselves or, yeah the, you know, I, this is the the other issue we run into is and that it leads on to the next thing yeah is that there is a spiritual vulnerability with converts mm. and this isn't to say this is attached to your level of intellect uh i mean i'm an educated woman i had adult children when i converted i'm college university educated it doesn't matter because i'm new to the faith and there is a, a part of of understanding that takes time when you mm -hmm. enter your new faith. And so a lot of reverts and converts, they're very vulnerable and can be potentially easy targets for people who want to take advantage of them. So mm -hmm. that's an issue that we see quite, quite often. Mm -hmm. And the solution to that is to really, like you said, is to surround yourself with good people uh, and really start to grow and learn of the Islamic framework so that you can empower yourself with understanding because you know, choosing your partner is choosing your future. You have mm -hmm. to choose wisely. You cannot base this on uh, just a, a feeling, you know, an attraction. It has to go deeper than that. And uh, you're a valuable person. Mm -hmm. You, you, to, so you yeah. really, really focus on helping people get to an understanding of not only, like you said, the, the data, but the dean as well. Mm -hmm. um, there comes with a level of that. Yeah. And brother, remind you of this thing about spiritual abuse. Mm -hmm. you know, someone who has more knowledge than you mm -hmm. in a specific area of life mm -hmm. you're new to this um this this new community right you 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 want to learn because perhaps uh, it's it's you're passionate about this you're you want like, to be accepted accepted yeah. exactly you want mm. a sense of belonging and and you want to fit in uh, and you want to learn and, and you can't separate between people and the faith Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot people conflate the two mm -hmm. the deen is perfect like yusuf islam said but unfortunately we have some people who come from that faith are not perfect mm -hmm. and the other extreme is some people from our faith are actually taking advantage of that fact yeah and and that's the truth and and, and really even though that sounds very uh, it's a sensitive thing but it's the truth it's it's yeah. 
happens we yeah we, it's the elephant in the room and people yeah. don't want to talk about it but it is it's happening and mm. we need more people to speak up about it and to bring it to light and bring it to the surface and wash it away and get rid of it because um the more we do that the less it happens and that's what we're hoping and one of the one of the ways that um uh, particularly um our, our sisters are more vulnerable uh, and that you can get the stats, you know, the more women, and you know this as well, and I think everybody knows it, perhaps that more women become Muslim than 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 men. Mm. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that um, men tend to uh, take advantage of that. But the way to protect yourself is, again, go back to that support network. The last time I did it. You know, go back to, back to that support network of... You know, having new beginnings, you know, in 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 your in your corner, or having someone that you know is 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 uh, going to be um, a, a guide, a, a mentor, a, a support, especially when you're looking at uh, finding something or you're courting someone. It's very important because it's very easy to put wool over over your eyes if you don't know the information, you know, in detail. Mm. And 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 so what? Um, um what is happening in these scenarios what what you know red flags are people uh, are people missing that they should really be aware of now this is really good so first of all it's important to understand that red flags can be different for every single person but when we talk about the convert um it's really important you know to understand what your sp spiritual blueprint is and this is a beautiful concept and your spiritual blueprint is exactly how you are living out your faith who you were before and who you want to be it's this combination it's your uniqueness of you and there's some things that just don't they're not compatible with that so for example you know if you are a convert and you love to uh learn at your own pace at your own time you don't want to be forced to try to do something that you're not ready to do. You may not do well in a relationship with someone who has expectations that you're already at the finish line. You're already mm -hmm. wearing the hijab. You're already, you know, praying five times a day. You're already fasting all of Ramadan. You already know how to recite all the Quran. These are really high expectations of someone who's very brand new to the faith. So, you know, that could be a red flag for someone to have those high unrealistic expectations. Um, and for some people, they may be looking for that as well. Yes. And, and that's I, the thing. That's why I want to say this, because there are some converts who come into this who are, they're eager, they're go-getters, mashallah, they are, they're, they're doing much, they're work, working at a much higher, faster pace, and they want to be with somebody who can take them to that level quickly. Um, mm. They're looking for that partner who is going to push them and, and elevate them mm. quick. And that's okay too. So that's what I was saying. Red flags are really unique. Uh, to every person mm -hmm. that this is that intrinsic nature brothers brother and sisters it's that intrinsic nature that you know who you are you know your it's not it's not nothing to do with your capability it's to do with capacity yeah right does does one have the capacity to do these things we don't know what um childhood someone's had their experiences maybe maybe they've lived in circumstances even far worse than i have right so everyone's blueprint is different and that's why it's called a blueprint. And, and knowing yourself is the most important thing. You know, what are my needs based on who I am and what I, my journey's been, what my story is telling me up to now. We have something called Unfold Your Own Love Story. And it's all about, you know, going back to your childhood and, and seeing those really significant points in your life that really tell a story to us, as in who you are. Mm -hmm. And that, when that goes off on a tangent in a very quick and extreme way it can leave people a very disillusioned brother and that's the yeah. truth sometimes what happens is especially with converts they feel so disillusioned by that sudden it's like doing a u-turn <laughs> where you're not mm -hmm. allowed to do a u-turn on a motorway and it's mm -hmm. like you know you're gonna have an accident right and and and, and that's it literally you know and and, and unfor that's unfortunate because they weren't designed like that as, 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 as a human being. Their design was a bit different. And it's about recognizing what is my design, but also those people around that individual, the mentors need to understand this is the design of this person. This is what uh, they need. I would love, I would, if it'd be okay with you, I would love to like say a few green flags for the convert. Because mm. we always Absolutely. talk about red flags. When we're talking about yeah. marriage. Let's talk about some green flags, things that are like, they're waving the green flag. This is a go. This is great. 
you can't go wrong with these. The first one is someone who's empathetic, okay? And this is so important for the revert because they're able to see things from another perspective because I guarantee you're coming from very different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so empathy is an amazing one. The second one is uh, open-minded. Someone who's able to negotiate and someone who's able to you know, really understand things from a perspective they've never maybe seen before. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. opposite of that would be narrow-minded yeah. or yeah. someone who's budge unwilling it. to, to yeah, unwilling to compromise at all or negotiate. That that's a huge one. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, we you know, Taff and I, we've been doing this for many years now, and we have come to there's two things that we say if you have this in your relationship, you are destined. Uh, for a much greater chance inshallah. of success, inshallah. And that first one is having a compatible purpose. And the second one is having an aligned faith. Now there's lots of other things. And trust me when I say this, similarity doesn't always equal compatibility, okay? Sometimes it's our differences that actually bring us closer together. Mm -hmm. But these two cat categories, you know, um, and when I say compatible purpose, I'm not saying you have to have the same purpose, they just have to be, uh, you know, something that isn't, they don't conflict with each other. They don't compromise each other. Uh, and that's really important. We just see, we're not saying that it's impossible to have a relationship without this. It's just your chances of having a more connected, successful relationship is much greater. Um, and the second one is an aligned faith. So, and sorry, just on the first one, Victoria, yeah. sorry, uh, apologies for interrupting you. But so when you talk about um, uh, this, this, uh, uh, sorry, what was the expression you shared? Was it shared, shared purpose or? Compatible, compatible purpose. Okay. So what does that actually look like? What, can you give an example of, of what a compa two compatible purposes look like? Sure. Yeah. So first of all, what is purpose? Okay. Your purpose is your passions plus your values equals your purpose. Okay. Okay. So um, not everyone has their purpose figured out. Trust me, we're all sitting in this room. I'm, I'm a grandmother. I'm still, I'm st I know my part of my purpose, but it's, it's evolving. It, you know, so that's first, that's what it is. So a compatible purpose, let's just use an example. Let's say a woman wants to stay home and raise a family. And she doesn't really, she's not called to be a work or be entrepreneurial. She just wants to, she wants to like take care of those children and raise her family. Mm -hmm. Now her purpose may be in creating that legacy, that generation and raising those children the best of her ability. That could be her purpose. Now, when she marries someone, she has to make sure she is someone who is going to be able and willing support, to yeah. support that purpose and not somehow put her at, at arm's length from it. So if she were to marry a man who says, I don't want to settle down. I need to move around the world. I'm going to be doing charity work in all these countries. I don't want to have stability. That's not my life. It might not. And that's his purpose. And they both have a purpose. I'm yeah. Mm. They have a, but they kind of, yeah. It's not to mm. say that they can't be, there can't be a negotiation. So maybe it's, we homeschool the children and I'll, we take them with us. Then we're on the road. We're a family. Mm -hmm. No, it's not to say that people can't do that, but you know, what... if, it, if you're aware of these things, then what happens? You can have a conversation about these things. But if you're not really aware about purpose and how purpose can either bring you together or even set you apart, then you're going to be surprised. You know, maybe yeah, six absolutely. months a year down the line when things really come out and you find, oh my God, I thought it was going to be like this, but actually mm -hmm. he's always away. He's yeah. just never at home kind of thing. And we hear a, we hear a lot of people go, how how do I do? how does someone determine what their purpose is? What are, you, what are you talking about? This seems like it's going to be, what is that going to take years of my life? And mm -hmm. to be honest, you know, if someone hasn't taken the time to determine one, what they're passionate about and two, what their guiding values in life is, then you need to kind of ask yourself how confident they would be in deciding what they need and want in marriage. Yes, mm. that's the thing. Because yeah. they may not have a clue about those things if they haven't even taken the time to like, be on that journey to discovering and so mm -hmm. if you yourself are looking for marriage this is a great place to start discover mm -hmm. your purpose and the difference you'll have here and the distinction is either you'll end up in a typical marriage right and th and that's i'd say the majority of people or a thoughtful marriage right and there's a difference there the first one typical is about having um transaction Tra tra transactions transaction are important relation. yeah they're important but, but it's at the base and, that, and that's mm -hmm. it 
But what you ha- what you have with a thoughtful uh, relationship is you have a relationships you relate to each other, and there's more communication there. There's more connection, connection there. There's more uh, empathy and all of those other wonderful things. So it's it's not just your everyday functions of life. Mm-hmm get up work children yeah it's 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 far greater than that so it's more about you know how do we help each other towards jannah but in a more thoughtful way how do we help you know really strengthen each other and support each other uh, in the ebbs and flows of life yeah how do we ride through this uh life and have and actually have an incredible time doing it as much as possible uh, on top of that so and, it's about it, all those things. And it goes back to that, you know, is it life by default? Is it a relationship by default or is it by design? And what we're saying here is that when it becomes design, it becomes such more, much more interesting because what you're looking at is you're looking at purpose. Mm-hmm. You have those conversations now and you're looking at how is our faith aligned? And this is this metaphor here is is uh, amazing uh, if you don't mind well, we'll sharing get to align faith yeah yeah well getting back to the purpose i just want to say it doesn't take rocket science to do to uh to figure out what your purpose is and you know most people spend more effort picking out a new car i'm telling you do the time read a book get with a coach a therapist a friend you know do the journaling whatever you need to do to start working mm-hmm. this out believe me um it, it's easy uh, to to work out to start that process so yeah, the second one is an aligned faith. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this is really beautiful. Um, so I guess we'll use an analogy. analogy yeah. So an aligned faith would be that you're on the same motorways. You call them in England and in America, we call them highways. You're on the same motorway, the same road, heading towards the same destination. Now you're on that same path. You may be in different cars at different places on the road especially in your understanding of faith and your development as a spiritual person, but you're on the same road, you're heading to the same destination. We can tell you that couples have this aligned faith. It really, truly marital satisfaction goes through the roof. This is probably one of, this is one of the top things that if you can have this in aligned faith with your spouse, will it will just take all their categories and, and raise them. Mm-hmm. We, we've seen it in our work we've seen it um in our own marriage as well mm-hmm. so and the opposite to that if you don't mind sure it, really that distinction helps you understand what this really means oh about the yes the, on the road yeah it, diff- when you're traveling the opposite direction yeah if you're tra- yeah you can tell them that so then. yeah so you, you're, on, you're on the same motor right but you're heading one direction and the, the, the other person heading a different direction mm-hmm. you're on the same motorway i.e you you have the same faith but you're going in opposite directions. And, right? it, and even so, better if you could be in the same car together. That would be yeah, amazing. The is, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You're, tra- you're traveling on this journey, right? <laughs> Towards wherever this happy place is. Uh, for us, we're talking about Jannah here, right? We're ha- hereafter, you know, the mm-hmm. pleasure of Allah. So when, 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 when you're traveling in the same direction, in the same car, the ultimate best. But, you know, hey-ho, like they say, sometimes we, we, we have people who are, are on a different different kind of same path but you know in different places spiritually mm-hmm. and therefore somebody for example in in the convert uh, lifelong muslim kind of scenario it could be that someone's far ahead and someone's just embarked upon the motorway mm-hmm. but really what's important is that they're both heading in the same direction and the empathy exists right the open-mindedness exists you know p- that the, the, both people can understand each other and expectations are clear they're not, you know, sky high of each other. And, and they understand that, you know, there's this, um, you know, like Allah says that, you know, your garments for each other, it's your, your, your becoming that support for each other. You know, you protect each other, you guide each other, you mentor each other. Uh, and, 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 and that beautiful uh, symbiotic, you know, relationship then lends itself to, to this marital satisfaction where mm-hmm. you, then we'll receive this mawadda and rahmah, you know, love and mercy, which Allah talks about. Mm-hmm. And that, that, those things come through as acting, you know, doing something within our marriage. Mm-hmm. Don't just come because of a default, you know, once we get married, we'll have love and mercy. No, we've got to work 
at being loving to, towards each other and being merciful towards each other every single day. There's, there's no time off with this one because the mm. most important institution we believe is, is the uh, nucleus of society, which is the family. Mm. Uh, and when the family is good, yeah, society yeah. becomes good. And, and, mm. and all the scientists talk about this, you know, who talk about relationships that, you know, especially Muslim scholars talk about how important the nucleus of society is, the family unit. And the family unit has to be a unit that's not only just functioning, but it's thriving as well. So it's continuously working at, you know, any uh, challenges that come. Challenges are normal, you know, arguments are normal it's not yeah. an abnormal thing in fact. Health, healthy couples argue healthy couples have conflict yeah. it's how they repair and how fast they repair that really determines success mm -hmm. and learning how to communicate and how to have conflict resolution is a skill and we don't most of us whether you grew up as a muslim or not didn't learn it no mm -hmm. we didn't learn it trust me um we saw our parents argue or fight and usually they made up behind closed doors that's typical. So we didn't see the conflict. We never saw the resolution. We saw the conflict. And mm -hmm. so a lot of couples who come to us, they need those skills. They mm -hmm. need to learn them. And, and, and in fact, well, data suggests again, you know, uh, John Gottman says that, you know, most uh, conflict between a couple are unsolvable. Which means they're just arguing about the same thing year after year. You will never be able to solve them because there's a, a huge difference between where you stand and where I stand. Mm. Like, like Canon, Canon and Nikon, yeah. No, I'm, jo I'm joking. I, I was giving a cam <laughs> camera joke. Sorry, sorry. And 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 I just think about it and reflect on that. We we may end up actually having a conflict about most of the time, but things we can't solve. Mm. They're unsolvable. They'll they'll never be solved. So it's like, wow. If we're t if we're really mostly arguing about these things, then something needs to change. We need to just understand that. Never the twin shall meet, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how it's going to be. And, mm -hmm. and then you can start to live uh, in, in a more healthier way with each other, understanding, okay, that's her point of view, that's his point of view, and, and, that, and that's fine. And, and there could be a historical perspective, you know. Usually it's something existing. very deep underlying there that's much deeper than the surface. So it's not about arguing about who's going to do clean up after the dinner. It's usually something different. Yeah, so. it could be hopes and dreams. There's so many deep things that you can, we can talk about this, but it could be hopes and dreams that a person really wants to have, but you can't actually see it from their perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um, um, you, you were talking about to like what one of the big takeaways for, for me at least from this, and and, and I uh, and I hope for beg your pardon for people listening is this idea of open mindedness and um, uh, empathy. So it is this, it may be a silly question or it may kind of throw a spanner in the works, but how does a person um, who's looking for a potential spouse, how do they, uh, how do they identify these things accurately without projecting, like if they want a certain outcome, if they want to get married to a certain person or they see this potential for attraction and it is, is it possible that a person romanticizes that and sees that in the other person where it's not truly there because they're looking for it? Absolutely. So we work with a lot of singles who are trying to prepare to get married and knowing the right questions to ask and knowing the right observations is that is the key, key to everything. That's the key to everything. So you asked such a brilliant question. Yeah. And um, when Taff and I were courting, I grilled him. When I mean grilled him, like I asked him the questions like you had never I sometimes seen. I didn't know the question. I didn't even know where I was, you didn't know where was going. To. And that was a beautiful thing about this. That, you know, ask a question without asking a question. So I'm thinking, oh, right, that's a really great question. But I don't know what she's looking for. So, mm. you know, when we talk about an aligned faith and uh, one, by the way, one of the other green flags is someone is finding someone who's faithful, um, who's faith conscious of God mm. and on that path. And so how do you discover that? Because look, you can be Muslim by name, but mm. are you living it? Um, and so instead of asking how many times do you pray a day? ask about something a little bit deeper that might be harder to, mm. you know, for them to answer. Um, they have to think about it. Like, what is the last prayer you made to God about? What is, um, what is, you wow, know, a powerful question, right? Or, wow. Wow. or even something like if you had a chance to meet the prophet, peace be upon him and ask him one question, what would you ask him? 
I, I will, I guarantee you ask that question to a brother or sister, you will determine their level of understanding, number one, and their level of, you know, <laughs> of being I told you that high conscious. Nice. So some of these questions, it's not about, it's not about determining, oh, their last name is Islamic. Oh, they, they, they've attended the Juma prayer. Those are beautiful things. Those are great. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But what are they doing in between? Yeah. What are they doing when, when nobody's watching? Yeah. Or even things mm -hmm. like, uh, what, what do you get out of prayer when you pray? It's yeah. Like if a person doesn't pray or just understands that I've got to pray five times a day and, and they don't really do that thing, then they're going to be stuck. Mm. But you know, you'll know the the depth of someone the, the more they kind of can articulate themselves from a very emotive point of view. Well, at the mm. time, you know, um, when Taf and I were courting, uh, I was really big on the love languages, and we we teach it now to Muslims. We we have an amazing course called the Language of Love. But it, I had asked him. I knew my top love language was physical touch. So how on earth do you discover if someone can meet that physical touch love language? 4,000 miles away. 4,000 miles away and in a halal way, right? Mm. So, and then I also needed to determine how open-minded is this brother? How much is he able to meet me where I'm at and my development as a person, as a, as a, as a Muslim? And so I asked him, I asked him a tough question. He, at the time, uh, was on the committee for a mosque and working at the mosque. And I said, it's Juma prayer. And we just attended, we're married. We come out of the mosque and there's all these people, you know, oh, lots of people. It's a very the, busy the, mosque. My, the committee members, you know, all, all those how, people that know me. How right? would you feel if I walked up and held your hand and grabbed onto you? In front of everyone. In front of everyone. And I was a real honest question. I said, look, and don't, I didn't want to bully him into like answering it in a right or wrong way. So I didn't give him any information ahead of time. My, for, for all I knew, he might've thought, well, she's testing to see how um, respectful I am of her space and modest he didn't know what, what answer was right or wrong. No. He, I just wanted his answer. Mm. Um, and it, he answered and, and, it. And actually, you know, uh, I think it's really helpful if I reflect here. The first thing I thought about was what will they think about me? You know, uh, the imam, the committee members. <laughs> that was my default kind of uh, thought straight away. Cult cultural conditioning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> was, uh, I had all this in me. I didn't even realize. And all this is happening in 60 seconds flat, right? It's all these thoughts really whizzing like rockets. Like, what will they think? Who'll be there? I could picture them in my mind. And then in the last 15 seconds, I'm thinking, well, she said, if we're married, it's halal to hold hands. I said, so what? We're, we're, you know, we can hold hands. And, you yeah. know, I might find it a bit awkward because <laughs> I'm not used to that. But the real thing is that it's, it's jaisy, it's acceptable. So mm -hmm. I said, well, it wouldn't be a problem because, you know, if we're married, then we're, we're married and we're holding hands in public and it's, it's good for us. So yeah. she, she had two answers in one. So the yeah. physical touch, but also mm -hmm. is it open minded or not? Yeah, definitely. And um, actually, to flash forward, the day of our nikah, we're in the mosque with everybody. The sheik is sitting there at the table. Everything's very formal. And the, um, sa the same imam. That the I'm same thinking. imam. Yeah. And so we're sitting there and... Uh, you know, I'm the only convert in the room, you know, it, it, this is my first process doing this. And he reaches over after the imam pronounces us, you know, our nikah is complete, we're married. And he reaches over in front of the whole room and he, he holds my hand. And it was really beautiful and everyone applauded and, and the mubruk and it was really exciting. So I knew he had really listened. But another, you know, thing uh, before I had met Taf, I was in the process of, of courting many years before that with uh, another person. And um, I was on my way to meet their family. Uh, and I wasn't wearing a hijab at the time. I was not a hijab wearing, you know, Muslim yet. And mm -hmm. um, I remember driving and pulling up to the house and I'm about to meet this family, okay, that I'm uh, this brother I was speaking with. Uh, and he knows who I am. He knows that I don't wear hijab. I'm in my development of my faith. And and he texts me on my phone and he says, put your hijab on before you come in my house or the house to meet the family. Now, this is about making observations, right? So mm. I put my hijab on. Of course, I have it. I have my bag with me for prayer. And so I, I put it on. I'm thinking to myself, am I, am I pretending to be something I'm not right now in order to impress somebody? And um, this was an observation I'm giving this example because we need to watch these things. Um, this was showing me his capacity to be number one, open-minded mm -hmm. and number two, empathetic to where I was. Because now I walk in, I meet his whole family in a hijab. Does that mean I always have to wear it when I'm with them? Well, well I have to pretend that I'm at a state uh, in my faith development that I'm not at. Um, so this is, these things are really important.
in that mm. picking a spouse. Wow. Okay. Amazing. That's just so so interesting. Re- really, <laughs> really interesting. Uh, uh, I've literally got through the first question that I'd wanted to ask, but I know that. <laughs> oh, mashallah. I know. I, I I know the time's getting on. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions if you guys have a have a few minutes. Um, yeah. but yeah, before. Please. Before I mention, thank you. But, uh, before I mention the, uh, before I open it up to questions, um, I do want to mention that um, New Beginnings is hosting a marriage workshop, which is uh, based on three sessions. The first of which I think um, is with yourselves, and that's going to be focused on um, the story of self, right? So about yeah. this, can, can you tell us a little bit what that's going to be about? Yes, yeah, go more into what we spoke about earlier is about how our unique story and blueprint actually is very telling of number one, who we are, but also how that needs to be really protected. Absolutely. And it's about not losing that identity when you when you have this new identity as a, a person of, of, of the Islamic, the Muslim faith, you know, a, a person of God. It doesn't change you to the other extreme or any extreme for that matter. You have to maintain that intrinsic identity of who you are. And, and we go into that, you know, we go into that, the spiritual blueprint as well. So it's really we, about- we have three parts to it. Really excited. So the first one is like uncovering your story, who you are, like you were saying. And the second part, which I absolutely love, and this is huge, is identifying your gifts. And as comfort, sometimes we have imposter syndrome. We think we're walking into this world and we're pretending to be something we're not. And let me tell you, you're not an imposter. You are valuable. You have things that have brought you to this point in your life that do not need to be erased. They need to be embraced. That's a really huge thing. So about really embracing your gifts and understanding what you do bring to the table in a potential marriage. Um, And that's difficult sometimes for the convert to do that. So, and the last one is creating your spiritual blueprint and understanding what are your needs spiritually and mm. how would I find someone that's going to be compatible with that, mm. that uniqueness to me. So we're really, we're excited about it. I, it's, it, we're super passionate about this and inshallah, it will be a really incredible course. I know sure. it will be. It, sound, it sounds amazing. It sounds really, really amazing. Um, I know you're married, but you, you know, if you and your wife want to jump on and, uh, you know, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I'll, I'll be totally honest I wasn't planning on it but I think after today this is genuinely this isn't like me just plugging it but like I, it, it's so interesting what you're talking about um that I think I will join it um, and, we'll, and we'll be starting that process of we talked a little bit earlier about your passion we won't go over like helping you define your passion but we will go over how to define and discover uncover some of your values which is your story and that is it is gold it is gold in understanding the foundation of who you are before you do anything in life, especially getting married. So I'm really excited about that. Amazing, amazing. And that that is going to be on the six. So you guys are doing this the session on the 6th of Feb. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Well, session number one. Okay. So, so you guys are doing three sessions. Yeah. Well, session, oh. well, it is three sessions. So the first session is all us, Taff and I that night. Mm-hmm. And then there'll be a second session with Sister Henrietta. She is okay. going to go talk about the other. Yeah. So, and then it closes off with some beautiful understanding from an Islamic perspective with Sheikh Bilal. We're so excited. So um, we'll be taking that on the story of the self. Brilliant. I, I'm really looking forward to it. So, so the link is just in the chat there. So beginnings.org.uk forward slash marriage, where you can register for that. Um, so I promised to open up to questions so if you guys have another five ten minutes is that are you guys okay cool. absolutely 100 percent. cool right so um guys feel free to unmute yourselves or if you want to drop a message in the chat um please go ahead we're, we're very friendly so we, <laughs> <laughs> nothing's off ask yeah, us anything please, relationship yeah. you know grill us give us yeah. uh give us some uh make a sweat we can yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I know people will have questions. I know. So please don't be shy. This is amazing, amazing opportunity. Um, yeah, we always say, we always say to people, um, be vulnerable and open with um, your experience because this is an interesting way of looking at sadaka or giving a, um, a blessing to someone else. Because sometimes when we share a question or an experience, 
undoubtedly there's someone else listening who has had that experience or had that same question and they didn't have the courage enough to say it and that's okay but you're you're almost in a way giving that gift to them because they can learn through you mm-hmm. and we always believe there's you know there's knowledge in the room there there's people here who've had experiences and have uh, questions that others may learn from mm-hmm. so that's that's really huge absolutely so i always think of it that way now when i when i go into a space and <laughs> and we're open, <laughs> i wouldn't say everything wrong, we're open to learning as well it's never the case that we know everything right mm-hmm. you know we're open to learning as well from others inshallah that's a it's a really beautiful perspective really um question wow mashallah go on victoria this is this is an amazing question oh fact. do you want me to answer this or do you want you yeah how did taf's prosper? okay the question is uh assalamu alaikum uh jennifer uh how did taf's past trauma affect your relationship awesome question so first of all let's just i'll, I'll quickly just uh, as a coach talk um what is a trauma right so a trauma is something that happens to within us it's not necessarily something and it can be different for every person. It's not necessarily what happened to you. It's what happened inside you. So there can be big traumas, like uh, talk about Holocaust survivors and people who survive um, sexual abuse. And then there's small traumas, like uh, being neglected by your parents uh, because they were busy working all the time. Or so there's lots of traumas. Mm-hmm. That So there's a variation. And no one is worse or better than the other. They, it just like I said, it all affects us. So differently. Mm-hmm. Your trauma shows up, um, showed up quite a bit in the first few years. Um, and Taff, based on his um, experience growing up, he had a lot of abandonment um, issues because his parents unfortunately got divorced and he was literally, and I mean this, like, and I don't just say this haphazardly, he was literally shipped to Pakistan with a stranger on a plane as a child and like basically put into a stranger's home and was re- lived there for years. Two years, yeah. Uh, and then had to come back to England, relearn English, um, and start a whole new life again. Mm -hmm. So he has a lot of abandonment uh, and trust issues there. Um, And that showed up a lot in our beginning of our relationship, because, you know, we both had a lot of abandonment issues. And Mm -hmm. there's a lot of not sure if what I was telling him, he was taking it to heart, and it was Mm -hmm. the truth. If he could truly trust me, if he knew I was here to stay. So, yeah. So uh, my childhood trauma or my inner child, okay, was one who was abandoned. And the abuse you encountered in Pakistan. Yeah. yeah. So my abandonment was very, very real uh, in that sense. And it was something that actually uh, lived with me for 40 years and through both my marriages so I was married twice before and so the way it manifested itself was that can you imagine somebody who's been abandoned right and they they don't know that this is deep within their subconscious right the the prospect of the, the the process of being abandoned again because when those feelings come up when when a tense situation arises so for example an argument or someone says I don't want to know you anymore. I don't want to see you anymore, right? Is I don't know about what's going on, but my body, our bodies remember patterns, right? So when something's said or something is done that you recognize, what happens is your, your body goes into an emotional state. And that emotional state uh, is triggered by something. And then what happens is it's almost like a, a recall of everything that you experienced before. And if you're not aware of this, and if you don't lean into your emotions and try to work them out, what can happen is it can be a perpetual thing that keeps affecting your relationships and the way you show up or don't show up for that matter. Yeah, it'll keep showing up in other relationships, friendships. Uh, And this is really important because um, this question was really profound because trauma does show up for a long period of time and it takes a long time to heal from it. Do not, we always tell people you need to start being curious about where these things are coming from before you get married. It doesn't mean you need to be healed and it's gone before you get married, Mm -hmm. Uh, but you need to be open with your partner about, you know, like for me, I had been in a domestic abusive relationship for many years before I married Taff. And um, I had to be really open and honest with him that 
there are traumas that I have surrounding certain situations, so much so that we actually wrote within our Nika contract that there is no yelling in our home. <laughs> because it's a trigger for me. Um, being in a home with someone who was really volatile for 20 years and who was very violent, we don't yell, we just don't. It's not a thing we do in our home and we put it in our Nika contract. So it was like this beautiful, clear expectation between us. Mm. And mashallah, he's a very calm man. He doesn't yell anyways, uh, which is perfect, but- And the thing was uh, um, for, for, Je for Jennifer, look, the, the, the most important thing here is that um, be before, so I'd done the work in the sense that I worked with somebody for eight months. And in fact, it was only because of that work, I'd realized I had this tra childhood trauma. Now, I was given many different things to, to work through those um, uh, emotions, through journaling, reflective exercises, one-to-one -one stuff. So I became aware that every so often, he, that child, would show up. And what he was saying to me was that, Oh my God, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen to you again. Now, there'll be certain things that Victoria says to me even now, which may not be anything. Maybe something just genuinely anybody would say in, in a, a, a couple scenario. But because there's some words that are still there uh, that I recognize or certain body movements I recognize, he shows up again. But I'm a little bit more aware now. So when he shows up now, I kind of, I know what I need to do. So what I do is I withdraw, start breathing. And I, and I say to her, I need a few minutes. So it's- And I'm able to recognize that because we've talked about it. So yes. this is how mm -hmm. being in a relationship and you're really aware about it and you talk and about it. And it's so it. important because if, if your partner doesn't know what's going on, they may think, actually, th this guy is just like <laughs> always crying or always, you know, kicking off or always- Yeah, like, be, definitely. It's too sensitive. Mm -hmm. and, and what's going on here? But- because she's aware, she knows, oh, okay, it needs a few minutes. And because I'm aware, I know, okay, she needs a few minutes. And I shouldn't actually take this any further now because it's not going to come back from this if I continue anymore. So it's it's, it's, it's being aware of your own triggers mm -hmm. and, and, and past experiences. And being being real with that, communicating with each other and making sure you're both actually, this is, this is the most important thing. You both actually provide that space for each other and that's the most important you have to hold space for them whilst they it's not your job to fix someone else no. but it is your job to hold space for them if you've chose them as your spouse so, and this is very important. so when i throw my pacifier out my dummy out right in that extreme scenario when i when i'm like you know crying a little bit she holds space for me she knows what's going on and then inshallah eventually it it, it, it subsides Okay, we have a beautiful question from Sister Sophia here. Okay, she asks, what role could my family have in my choice of marriage? I was raised a Christian, but nor me or my family were really followers, but they are very clo closed off to the idea of me marrying a Muslim. Since they do not know I am a believer, they think that I would never convert and that I cannot marry a Muslim unless I do convert. I will be taking my shahada at the end of the month, oh, mashallah, wow. and plan to tell them next month about it. But I don't know how they will react when I decide to get married. How should I let how should I let their opinion affect any future decision I make? Okay. First of all, let me just say congratulations to you for making a decision to putting your well-being first and your um what you know you need. Um, this is really important. We need to respect our families but they are not the drivers uh, of our life. We are the main character. Your family is supporting characters. So that's that's important to know. Um, this, this is a tough choice um, to make. And I think if I, my children were all mostly all adults when I was courting with TAF and I did let them in on it and they know, and I, I tried to explain things as much as I could. But what you have to remember is that people in your life are not on this journey with you. They do not understand the faith, like you're going to understand it. And we can't expect others to accept all these new changes, like, because we're accepting it. We, we want our people around us to accept it, but th the reality is, it's just not going to happen. So I would, uh, my suggestion is, is to, uh, we say in America, if you say it here, but with a grain of salt, do it with a grain of salt, slightly sh uh, share those things with them. Uh, let their, their, they know you, these are your parents, they know you and they will definitely inevitably have advice about who 
would be best for you. And it's okay to take some of that on. But if there's a hard line there about somebody being a Muslim, uh, then you may have to decide that they're take their advice with a grain of salt, because we don't cert certainly want you to. I, I was going to say something that, you know, um, take, take one thing at a time, you know, um, I would say right now, don't uh, worry about the marriage thing right now. You know, I'd say that the most important thing for you now, uh, inshallah, uh, by Allah's will is to take a shahada, you know, um, uh, embrace that fully, you know, uh, work with whoever you're working with to, to strengthen your faith uh, and, and that faith journey. Don't change as a person uh, with your family because the, the, the best thing I have learned from many, many converts over the years is that when they remained um, very connected to their families, you know, their families saw a change in them and the, their character, which really uh, create, created this uh, really warm feeling towards um, them accepting the faith, you know, and, and I think that's probably um, a strength that, you know, when you, when you really um, remain who you are and, and, they, and they see these, uh, your character, because Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi peace be upon him, was sent to perfect, you know, manners, you know, when our uh, characteristics and traits, you know, become um, finely tuned, as it were, and, and you know, we, we, we become uh, these exemplaries of our faith, you know, th they will be more, I say, acceptable to, to those decisions you make in the future. And when it comes to marriage, I think you'll be in a, in a lot better and stronger place and clearer in mind as to how to share that with them, um, inshallah. And and yeah, definitely. And remember that uh, people people don't uh, people can change. Okay, people can soften. And mm -hmm. I didn't know one single Muslim before I took my uh, before I started studying Islam I didn't even know a Muslim I had no clue to me it was completely foreign I didn't know anyone so for my kids my children who are adults they they started to see a woman start to wear hijab and practice and do these things so it was very foreign to them I had to you know give them time and now mashallah my kids still call me they they greet me islamically they um they fasted with me during ramadan and so the my daughter even wore a hijab she's 27 she uh, took a put a she came next to me during my shahada and stood with me so look you know and that's after studying for a year so we don't know how God will soften the hearts of people around us. But like you said, by, by being an example, if you show them that, yes, I'm changing, but I'm changing for the better, but I'm still me inside. Mm. Um, that will definitely. I'm still your sister. I'm still your daughter. And that, yeah. That, and then nothing changed. That never changes. I'm still a mother to all my mm. children and they still celebrate Christmas and they do all those things. So, um, but they know I'm their mom first and foremost. Um, and yeah, definitely. I think we take one thing at a time. I hope that's answered. Uh, I know there's so much more we could say about that. Definitely. Do you want to read this next question? Yeah. Um, Ila, Islam alaikum, in the courting phase, do you think it's better to meet each other's families earlier, early on to get to know them or later on when you know that you want to get married? It's a really good question. For that, it's really individual. Um, we always, we, we definitely say that, you know, to get to know someone with intention. Now, in order to get to know someone, you have to be able to do the observations. Now, you have to have a way to observe them. And if it's just over text messages, how are you observing their character, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you might need to meet their family to see mm -hmm. how are they in action? How are they? Because they're going to be the, their most natural self around their family. They're, they won't be able to be too pretentious. So maybe it could be good for you to see them in that scenario mm -hmm. and to watch them interact with people that that they're used to yeah in fact that that does lead on to um if someone denies that meeting that could be a red flag yes absolutely so i write about this in the article that you know sometimes those things that um may help you identify red flags maybe the things that you need to do early on so for example within a week victoria said can we jump onto a video call and i'm an introvert and i'm really <laughs> shy and i was like um Okay, then. And literally, that, that's what it was like. But I remember in the first call, I, I, she describes it, I was really shy and kind of kind of almost giggling. But um, it, 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 it was what she needed. 
she needed confirmation that, yeah right that this guy isn't just anyone and uh trying to be pretentious that he's someone else uh and for her it was a very definite thing to have so like victoria said it, it, every scenario is different but if you really want to figure out if this person is genuine or not usually when you ask those bigger questions it does sift out people i think for you you have to ask yourself uh before you start meeting their family and friends uh you have to cross several things off your list first you need to make sure you're you're, you're starting you know you you're because it's like a there's layers of getting to know someone and once you really truly start to meet people i don't we don't ever want people to get in so far that they feel they can't get out if it doesn't feel right for them so know that your confidence level if i do meet the family if i do meet everyone and i still don't know if this is right for me i'm confident in making that choice mm -hmm. um so be cautious there protect your heart you know be guarded but open to learning about their family and their and their their connections um but but still be guarded in a protective way mm -hmm. i think that would be the my advice to you and okay. um, we did meet family uh over video chat and then my daughter yes. flew with me when i came so we did bring family as well mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just read so much. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very happy and learning. MashaAllah to Sophia. Okay, let's just read through this. Okay, what if later down the line, spiritual compatibility falls out of alignment? It means you've, um, if you've, you kind of had a period where there's a disconnect. So we have something called weekly check-in, right? For every couple, right? We We make time for everything else. Uh, but really, we always should have an opportunity to have a check-in with each other, how we are doing. And it's a genuine question. How has your week been? Is there anything I can support you with? Right? How can things be different? So we, we have uh, all this documented where couples check in with each other. There was one particular brother, uh, well, he divorced and they, and they were with, with each other for 20 years. And he said to me, and he said it in such a sad way, he said, I didn't realize for 20 years I made my wife a slave. And I says, what do you mean? He says, because the week after we separated, she went to a different mosque. And it was like almost the diametrically opposed way of thinking. He says, I cannot imagine what it must have been like for her for 20 years. So, you know, it's like they didn't have a check-in. <laughs> He didn't have a clue for 20 years. So it's beggar's belief. You know, how can you get to a point in 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 when you're living with somebody for 20 years, you don't know their you know innermost dreams and desires. And the I I guess the glue that holds us together is our faith, right? Yeah, I was gonna say a couple of things when you start to get to that spiritual feeling not aligned as a couple, um, that's really important is that you not only like you said check in but first of all you have to understand that your spiritual well-being is your responsibility first and foremost so if you're feeling um that you're not really connecting with god in a way that feels fruitful to you do a self check first okay the second thing is if you feel your partner is also not doing that it's okay in a marriage to be a mirror. A matter of fact, we're told to be mirrors for each other. And so it's okay to hold a mirror up and say, hey, I'm concerned. I'm not sure what's going on. Mm. I haven't been seeing you, you know, praying. praying as much. We haven't been reading Quran together or whatever it may be that you used to do or that you saw them do. And to say, check in with them say, what's going on? How can I support yeah. you? Are you okay? And um, mm. and then the, the last one here is really important is, literally get creative with your worship together this is something that muslim couples need to embody more inshallah more and more is taking your faith and getting creative with it learning a new con an islamic concept that's new to you together mm -hmm. um one of the things we used to do long distance we were long distance marriage actually for two years i, I didn't move well, for two yeah. years of our marriage we would do tafsir tuesdays on Tuesday, we'd pick a, an ayah from the Quran, we'd read it, we, it was like fun, and then we just talk about it, like free flow. Mm -hmm. And this really connected us. Um, so those are a few things. Those are a few tips. That's when I read the next question. Okay, Sister Eva says, Assalamu alaikum. 
Salam. You spoke about the role of mentorship in halal courting. My whole family lives abroad and I don't have Muslim friends in the UK at all. And my non-Muslim friends don't get our way of dating at all. I'm scared of doing this without guidance uh, that will lead me to make bad choices by ignoring the red flags to make things work with someone. Uh, Brother Imran, do, do you um, so give that support? Um, to in, individuals or where would um, Sister Eva kind of identify a mentor? Um, we, we, we do it informally so we don't we don't formally offer it, offer it as a service but if anyone reaches out to us then you know we've got we've got um, selves on the team and and some of a the network. other yeah. yeah so um, on on this might not be exactly what was been spoken about but there is I think there is some work going on around um guardianship and and the concept of having a willy for converts so there is some work that's going on in the background around that because that's obviously um slightly different to a mentor but it's like the first kind of uh yes. i don't say level of protection but you know the kind of filtering yeah. if as if you know yes one of a better word yeah, yeah. i mean somebody's asked the bottom where, where you i was going to say the first thing i would suggest to you is find your tribe okay get out there and proactively find your tribe it is very hard. Look, it's like making friends as an adult. Is remember when you're a kid and you're in you know school and you're trying to go up at the playground to make a new friend. It's tough for us converts to walk into a masjid or a mosque and to make new friends. But believe me, do it. It's you. You will never. You will not realize the people out there that are willing to support you and befriend you and connect with you um, without you reaching out. It's got to be a two way street. So if you're hiding in your house, <laughs> they're hard to find. They're hard to find you. So let them know you need. Um, let you know. Let them know you need support. That's the first thing. Like uh, Brother Imran said, is really reaching out to the people that you do meet and say, "Hey, I'm looking to get married. Do you know anybody that can give me some advice or guidance?" Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first thing. Um, second thing is, your non-Islamic friends, their non-Muslims, they still can give really good advice. You just let them know what your expectations are. Um, as long as you don't feel like they're going to be pushing you into doing something. Um, you know, my best friend is a very strong Christian. And uh, for, you know, my, my first birthday after converting, she bought me a beautiful box of hijabs. So she knew when I was on the journey to finally get married, she knew what, because I expressed to her what the guidelines were for me. She knew how to support that and to give me that that moral support, that mm -hmm. friendship support. So that's another thing. Mm -hmm. And you trust me, I had many friends checking on you, yeah, Muslim I, and no Muslim. I have no idea. <laughs> when we were in the courting phase, um, but, it was but really important. Common sense is common sense. Yeah, common sense. Common, is common sense, sense is common sense, and and I guess you have close friends. They can they can say this doesn't make sense at all, you know that kind of thing. When it comes to more religious matters then obviously there are, there are people who are qualified to advise on that. Absolutely. And I think it's really important to... I want to say something. Oh, go ahead, brother. Oh, no, it was just... just I had mentioned here about Solace, um, who are an organisation who are, who are offering a service. So the Solace friends of ours. So I think there's a... Um, there is... A, I'll just... Just someone sent me the website here. Um, so they've got um, a Wally Pal panel marriage service. Okay. That that's that's really useful to know. Um, Absolutely. Sorry, yeah, you were you you were saying. No, no, no. I was just saying, yeah, to just um definitely keep reaching out to people, asking for advice um from Muslim non-Muslim friends. It, but really, it is about creating that we call it the power of proximity, and the closest five people to you are going to be very influential to you. And if you're a new Muslim, you need to surround yourself with good Muslims. They're out there. And I don't, even if it's on social media, if it's joining organizations, if it's attending a new mosque or community center, really just go out on a limb, get courageous and do it. I'm telling you, they're out there. They're out there. So don't deny yourself that connection because the, it really will become your network of support when you're getting married, when you have children, when you, um, at, at, all the way through life. Believe me, um, that's how we work as an Ummah. We're we're a, we're like this web of support. Uh, people all over the world can connect and and help you in so many different ways. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, th there are so many more things to discuss, and obviously, it can't all be contained in one session. And I've kept you here longer than I I told you I would, so my apologies. Um, 
but thank you so much for joining us and and please uh, i hope people benefited and learned we're gonna upload this recording to youtube as well and please don't forget this workshop that um victoria and taff will be leading a part of so that's an illuminating your path in marriage so beginning beginnings.org.uk forward slash marriage uh thank you so much it's been honestly it's genuinely it's exceeded my expectations uh oh my and so much a benefit just regarding a, where a person is in on the journey and in life that you know i'm sure we all we all took something from sure. um so thank you thank you once again and we can't wait to host you again oh no thank uh, you thank you, 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 you everybody you, as well it was great being here it was an honor in fact mashallah thank you everyone for yeah. joining in the conversation that even if you're in your pjs having some hot cocoa, some tea, some coffee, wherever you are. We've yeah. really enjoyed your company. Really we really appreciate it. I feel we need to do a part two. I just, just this is, wasn't rehearsed, but I think we need to do a part two. Um, I think so. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> you, you, you've got us now. You've got us, <laughs> Brilliant. Um, sorry, just a, a message that someone had sent. So the recording won't pick up anyone's, uh, anyone's, uh, anyone else's video. So it's just, just um, myself and, and Victoria and Taff. So um, I nor will the chat be recorded either. So uh, cool. Thank you so much. And apologies to our wonderful, wonderful guests for staying so long oh, no. and sharing so much. Uh, we hope to see you. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. It's been an honor and a big thank you on behalf of myself, on behalf of New Beginnings and the community. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much.